All right, great. Uh, looks like we've got a pretty good group here already. So uh, welcome to Meet Ian webinar with Edge Impulse. Uh, Jan Janloom is here today with us to give you a look at the capabilities of Edge Impulse's new neural compiler, Eon, and a demo of it in action. Uh, Jan is an open source developer and technology evangelist working on TinyML as the CTO of Edge Impulse. Uh, so over the last several years, he's gone up and down the stack from embedded to web and everything in between. Uh, he's a strong believer of open source and has written thousands of patches for open source projects, including Mozilla Firefox OS, JerryScript, and ARM Embed. Uh, we've also got Jenny Plunkett here. Um, she's gonna help answer your questions throughout the webinar. Uh, she is a Texas Longhorn and software engineer. She's working as a user success engineer at Edge Impulse. Uh, since graduating from the University of Texas, she's been working in the IoT space from consumer engineering and developer support for ARM Embed to consulting engineering for the Pelion platform. Uh, so the first 15 minutes of today's webinar, uh, we'll have a presentation and then we'll have a demo as well. Um, and the last 15 minutes will be open for your questions. So if you do have questions during the presentation, um, there's a Q&A section at the very bottom of your screen. So you can click on that and ask your questions there. And Jan or Jenny will be able to answer as many questions as possible. They'll try to answer as many as, of those as they can before the end of the webinar. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is if you notice during registration, as part of the webinar, Edge Impulse is giving away an aura ring to one lucky winger, winner. So anyone who's attending the event will get their name entered into the drawing and the winner will receive an email by December 18th with more information on how to claim that prize. So thanks again for joining us and I'm gonna let Jan get us started. Hey, thanks so much. Um, yeah, my name is Jan Jungbaum. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Edge Impulse. Um, and so this is me. Um, actually, uh, four years ago in uh, Tanzania, trying to debug hardware. And um, I'm an embedded engineer by heart um, and not a machine learning practitioner, let's say. Uh, so, but for some reason, I managed to get into kind of the super interesting field of machine learning plus embedded. And I guess that that is probably the reason that all of you, I saw like 100 people already on the, on the webinar at the moment, all of you are also joining to explore kind of the, the synergy where sensor data, embedded systems and IoT devices and machine learning collide. So super excited to talk about that. Um, we're, what we're going to cover today is Eon. Um, that, that might sound scary. Um, it's a neural network compiler that allows you to run machine learning models on hardware, general purpose MCUs and uh, some DSPs as well in a lot less RAM and a lot less flash and with the uh, highest speed possible, depending on your hardware. Um, super excited to get in there. I'll ask Katie sadly 25 minutes or so of presentation. What an amazing demo here. I'll have, I have hardware here on my desk here. I have a Christmas tree that will participate here. So I hope everyone sticks out to the end. If you have any questions, um, please let Jenny know in the Q&A section. So as I said, I'm not a machine learning practitioner. But it doesn't mean that, that I'm completely unaware of what machine learning could do or, or you know, um, what that it could do or where the, where the applications or something are. Like for me, the very first time that I heard about machine learning and I heard about the idea that computers could have at that point kind of intelligence that was for me, it was um, seven years old at the time, eight years old at the time, it was kind of indistinguishable, it was here when... Um, Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov in a game of chess in 1996. This was a huge, huge leap in computer intelligence. For a very long time, we thought that a game of chess had too many states um, that a computer couldn't properly calculate every potential move. And as a human, we'll always be better at the game of chess, or at least for a very, very long time than a computer would. And already in 1996, it was disproven. Um, and then fast forward again, I think that, that for most of you, this was once again, kind of these hallmarks of machine learning and popular culture was when AlphaGo beat Lee Zedong in, in 2016, which also was thought at the, at the time that Go was such a complex game, which has so, so many complex states, this was impossible for a computer to calculate all the way through. And the two things that kind of, uh, or the, 
the thing that these two cases have in common, both Deep Blue as well as AlphaGo, um, is machine learning, yes, but also lots of compute. Um, and that's for me when I think, when I thought about machine learning back in 2016, when I heard about AlphaGo and about all the other developments that were happening around machine learning, you think about this data centers full of GPUs, crunching numbers. Um, and rightfully so, right? Um, I don't have the numbers for Deep Blue, but for AlphaGo, Google trained this on 5,000 TPUs. It was custom silicon specifically designed to create specifically designed for machine learning models for neural networks to train them really fast. So Google actually designed custom processors, custom silicon to train a model that was good enough to beat, to beat the game here. So for me as an embedded engineer, this, this was not really applicable or at least I, I thought so for a very long time. So how do we get from 2016 where this was still the case, clusters full or data centers full of GPUs or TPUs to a talk here today during, uh, during the webinar where we're saying that, well, we can actually run machine learning models on really, really small and tiny devices. This was a, um, a, a blog post by uh, Dan Sitaniake who wrote the tiny ML book for O'Reilly and, and currently works um, for us as an ML engineer around, I can actually build a tiny ML model that recognizes sounds in 23 kilobytes of RAM. This is not just a, a small step going from data centers full of GPUs to now we can run it somewhere. No, this is orders of magnitude that we've, that we've increased in the last four years. This is truly mind blowing. So how, how do we do something like this? How do we go from 2016, lots and lots of computes for machine learning models to actually running this on small devices and actually make it useful. Um, for that, I'd like to take a step back and see what an ML model actually is. Um, let's say that you're building a device that needs to detect whether water is boiling. So we all know um, water is boiling, at least is what you learn at school, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So naturally, if I want to notice, I attach a temperature sensor to my embedded system. I write a little bit of code and says, well, if the temperature is above 100 degrees, then the water is boiling and otherwise it's not. Very straightforward, a small algorithm. I have inputs, my temperature data. I have an algorithm, some rules, and then finally I have a conclusion, yes or no. Um, and this works nicely, right? So I go out and test this in the field. So here in my kitchen, you see behind me, I'll, you know, I'll make the, I'll get water at a temperature of 102 degrees. I test it with my sensor. The algorithm says, well, this is boiling and I observe that it's indeed boiling. Great, wonderful, my algorithm works. I do another sanity check. Um, now the temperature is 98 degrees. According to my algorithm, it shouldn't be boiling. And I observe that it's not boiling either. Wonderful. But now one of our customers goes mountain climbing with my sensor. Um, so here the temperature and it checks the value temperature is still 98 degrees. And according to our algorithm, this should not be boiling. But then you actually observe that, well, there's something wrong in my algorithm here. We observe that the water is boiling. So apparently there's a hidden variable somewhere that has something to do with the mountain climbing of our customer that changed the assumption in the model. Um, and machine learning is great at finding this hidden correlation. So we know that probably the altitude has something to do with the boiling temperature of water in this case. Um, so if you know that there's a hidden correlation, but you don't know what the hidden correlation is, that is a point where machine learning can help. So that starts by collecting data and preferably lots and lots of data. And the quality of this data has a direct effect on the effectiveness of your, of your model or of the algorithm that you're going to find. So um, this might be the data that we collect. At 98 degrees at a zero altitude, we don't see water boiling. At 102 degrees and at zero altitude, we do see boiling 98, 2500 and, and so forth and so forth. Um, so this is, a, this is a compute intensive or a human intensive process because someone needs to go in, go climb to different altitudes, put uh, or heat up water to a certain temperature and then write all of this down and have some quality assurance, et cetera, in here so you don't have any false readings. Um, 
So here what we refer to as the readings from our sensors, that is data. Data is the temperature, data is the altitude. And whether water is boiling, so what the outcome of this algorithm should be for our final function is our label. Um, now what our machine learning model can do, so in traditional programming, we had our temperature value, then we had a little algorithm above 100 degrees, yes, it's boiling under 100 degrees, it's not boiling. And then we have our outcome, yes, no. With machine learning, we kind of swap that around. We have our inputs, temperature and altitude. We don't know our rules, but we do know the outcome. So machine learning tries to approximate a function that best describes these rules. So you get the desired outcome there. So it's a function that most accurately maps data to a label. And this takes lots and lots of trial and error. Um, because we don't even know how many parameters we need. We don't know if we should use the raw temperature or a derivative of the temperature. Um, uh, and, you know, often it's not just two variables. You can kind of figure this out relatively quickly with these two, but we might have thousands of parameters because we're looking at, for example, audio signals. So this takes lots of trial and error, also because this process does not know anything about the inherent qualities of water. It just goes in and tries to find this hidden formula that most accurately maps data to a label. But what comes out of it at the end is a formula. And it might very well be that, you know, if you take altitude out of account, it might be some, or here actually, it might be a very simple formula of temperature plus altitude divided by 304. If that is above 100, then it's boiling and otherwise it's not. So the process of collecting data and then training an ML model on it, super compute intensive. And for that, we still need large clusters of GPUs. But afterwards, we can find the, the formula that we find is very often, we can kind of control this in training process, can be very small and really efficient. And in the end, it's just mathematics. There's no difference whether this formula that we found here at the bottom, whether I wrote that myself as an engineer after looking at the data or that the machine learning models wrote it for me. It's in the end, it's just mathematics. And the great thing is that microcontrollers are incredibly good at mathematics. A typical microcontroller, a Cortex-M4 um, running at 80 megahertz can do a few million operations a second on 8-bit integers. Um, so the beautiful thing here is I think that the interesting realization that I had and that a few other people had um, a few years ago, uh, mostly driven uh, by Google, by Pete Warden, and, and later at ARM by Neil Tan, who was working on my team, is that we realized that, well, the training phase of machine learning, that is the thing that takes lots and lots and lots of time and takes lots and lots of compute. But very often, at least if you look at sensor-based use cases, because we're looking at relatively short amounts of data, um, and we have a couple of other tricks up our sleeve that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we realize that if you just focus on the inferencing and just on classifying, just executing this formula, we can do that really, really efficiently on microcontrollers because microcontrollers are already optimized for that. So think of this, machine learning is not a magic black box. Machine learning, a machine learning model after you've trained it, it's just a mathematical function with a bunch of parameters. Um, there's a couple of trade-offs that we can do. So we can say we have typically in a machine learning model because you start in a random state. At the beginning, you don't know anything about the data. So you start in a random state. You want to fine tune all these small parameters a little bit. So typically we use float32 uh, weights, we call it for that. We realize that if we run the inferencing at the end, if we execute the machine learning model, we can do that with int8. Um, we lose a small bit of accuracy. We win a lot of speed because microcontrollers have vector extensions. Um, and thus they can do 8-bit integer uh, matrix math a lot faster. We do some tricks around reducing the number of parameters. We can, after we've found the function that best approximates data to a label, we can actually realize, okay, which of these parameters adds very little to the final outcome. We can strip that off. And more and more silicon vendors are actually pushing hardware optimized paths. So ARM, for example, on Cortex-M4, M7, and Cortex-M33, realize that the typical operations that you do in a machine learning model, like 8-bit vector, uh, vector math, um, is something that can already be done really efficiently on hardware. So they've pushed libraries like CMSSNN to make it really fast and do that. So 
it's really great kind of for everything. We have messy high resolution sensor data that you can't easily reason about in Excel. So if, if it's possible to just plot it out in Excel, kind of deduct, deduce the formula from that, great, please do that. Don't go into the machine learning world. <laughs> just leave it with that. But for stuff like recognizing sounds, which is really hard, there's infinite sounds around. Um, Biosignal analysis, which is also really hard because there's lots of data flowing in um, from all kinds of sensors on your, on your wrist or on your finger, like the aura ring, for example. Um, really hard to write an algorithm yourself to deal with that. Or stuff like abnormal vibration patterns or even detecting what you see here. We'll have a cool demo of that at a later point. So high resolution sensor data, perfect applicable to ML. So, okay, that brings me to a long introduction, 15 minutes. Um, but I think it's important to see where we came from. So um, when we decided to found Edge Impulse about a year and a half ago, we figured, okay, we know how to run, we know that we can run machine learning models efficiently on hardware, because in the end, it's just math. Um, we know how to accelerate typical operations um, on hardware, because we're embedded engineers. Let's build a tool, actually, build a place for people to build embedded machine learning models. Machine learning models that need to run on end devices. Machine learning models that deal with sensor data rather than with synthesized data. Sensor data is messy. It's very hard to get data right, label the data, et cetera. So Edge Impulse is an online environment um, that allows you to go in and build end-to-end -end machine learning models that operate on sensor data. And we're there every step of the way, from data collection from real devices all the way to deployment. And Eon, our neural network compiler, is part of that deployment story. I think we're also the largest kind of tiny ML embedded machine learning community at the moment. We have over eight and a half thousand real machine learning projects created already on the on the website. We have a super active forum with lots of people doing cool stuff. We have amazing people doing blog posts and new hardware, new use cases, etc. So. Um, if after today you're enthusiastic and you want to try that out, just go to edgeimpulse.com, it's free for developers, um, and just go start building stuff. Um, also today I'll show a couple of the capabilities that we have. We have cool end-to-end -end tutorials on vibration analysis, audio analysis, both keyword spotting as well as scene detection, like where am I or what do I hear or do we hear bird cheap, uh, birds chirping, um, as well as vision um, here at docs.edgeimpulse.com. Um, with amazing videos like this one from Dan on uh, detecting when a faucet is on in your house. So if you've toyed around with machine learning on devices or you've read about it, then you probably ran into TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, it's an amazing little project, or amazing, no, not a little project, it's an amazing project um, championed by Pete Warden at Google um, that is kind of the de facto way of running neural networks, which is not always a full story, but um, often a large part of the story, on embedded systems. And TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers um, is fantastic and it consists of three different parts. So it has an interpreter. So that is a, um, a piece of software that can read in a model file and that model file describes your machine learning model. It says, okay, I have this number of parameters. This is the way that they're connected to each other. These are the values of these parameters, um, et cetera. Um, but it's an interpreter, so it needs to be done at runtime, uh, which is uh, which also means that you need to know beforehand which of the operators are going to be in the model file. Um, so you need to define which kernels and operators, which type of functions in your machine learning model you're going to use. If you don't, you can use it without, but then you're wasting lots and lots of flash. Um, so the benefit there is that it's super flexible. Um, you can actually put the model file in external flash. And when you wanna update your ML model, you just write a new model file to external flash, restart the device, and now your device is a new ML model, which is brilliant, it's fantastic. Um, it also has wide support for hardware accelerated kernels. So these kernels, so a typical operation um, is, let's say a typical operation in an ML model is matrix multiplication on an eight bits, on, a, on two matrices, eight bits matrices. Um, they have a really nice way of plugging in new kernels. So if I'm ARM or I'm uh, Synopsys and I have a chip, a DSP that I know can do this stuff really, really fast, I can write an optimized kernel for that. It uses the DSP instead of the software implementation. And it means that I can run really, really fast. Fantastic. And 
kind of everyone is standardizing on this TF light kernel um, format, which I think is great for the industry. I think having kind of having people standardize on something um, that is open source is fantastic. The downside though, um, which is for me kind of as an embedded engineer really cares about kind of the RAM and ROM of my devices, often not just, just because I care about it, but also um, because the size of my model determines whether my project can be successful, whether it's going to fit on my device or whether the cost of my device actually makes sense. Is that it requires this interpreter, which is wasteful because this interpreter needs to initialize state. It needs to know about a wide variety of potential model files, um, which I often don't care about. Um, and you need to define these operators beforehand. Um, that's fine, we can do it automatically, but it's a bit of a nuisance. And this flexibility comes at a cost of um, having stuff in your firmware that you're probably not going to use. And that's because this interpreter can't know beforehand or the linker can't know beforehand what it can link out, what it needs to link in. So we started in a Gimples, a project um, a bit before the summer is called Eon. And Eon is a neural network compiler for general purpose MCUs that is actually built on top of TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we reuse from TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, including their kernels and operators, which is great because then we can, you know, we can both leverage as well as contribute back to the project. Um, but we get rid of the interpreter. So Eon takes a TensorFlow Lite model in then we, well, we, we do kind of cool thing. So on our servers, we load the TensorFlow Lite interpreter, we load our model, then we serialize the model state to C++ code, and that's the source code that comes out. Now the beautiful part there is that then we have an exact representation of the complete state of our ML model. And when we compile that, the linker knows everything that is used in TF Lite and everything that's not used, and it can link everything out. So the linker actually does most of the magic here, which I think is super cool. So think of Eon not as a completely standalone product. It's a kind of compiler, a state serializer for TensorFlow Lite. Um, and, it's, so, and the results are, are pretty insane if you look at the same models. So these are the same models. I'll have some numbers here, the same models run both in TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And this is with only the, the operators that are used loaded in to make it fair, and the full uh, the full overhead both in RAM and Flash. So the complete state of the interpreter, everything that gets um, linked in, and all dynamic and static usage. So for a fully connected network um, to do gesture recognition on a Cortex M, um, we see with TF Lite about 3.8k of RAM usage, very little actually, but with Eon because we can get rid of so much stuff automatically. We go down to one and a half K and for flash use it's almost the same. So we win 60% uh, less RAM usage and 45% less flash with the exact same accuracy because underneath is still the same kernels. So you don't lose anything. You win a tiny bit of speed, but very little um, because you don't need to load the interpreter. Um, so everything else stays the same, but a lot less RAM and flash. Um, same for convolutional neural networks. So this is a keyword spotting model running on uh, another Cortex-M device. We see RAM usage decrease from 13 to 8.8K um, and flash usage from 50K to 31K. And this might actually be the difference between using a more expensive part or a cheaper part that can save you pennies on the, on the bomb. Um, this gets even more extreme with large image models. So this is a ModelNet V2 model. Um, it's the one that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, running on an ARC DSP. Uh, so not even a general purpose MCU, but rather a DSP that is also enabled here. We see RAM usage go from 440k to 297k and flash uses from 766 to 577. Um, the interesting part here is this is running on this little DSP board. This thing has one megabyte of combined RAM and flash. So the model that we can now run with Eon because it takes 800k or 870k is something we couldn't run before on the same hardware. So we should have, we could have so we should have said we're going to use a smaller model, probably with less accuracy, but thanks to Eon, we can now fit larger models on the same hardware with the same performance characteristics, which I think is cool. So one of the things that we do in Eon, um, so we, um, we call it kind of unified kernels. Um, so what we do when we create our, uh, our release is that we load the 
optimizations, like for ARM cores or for ARC DSP cores, automatically in and make them available. And then dynamically at compile time, try to recognize what the MCU is that we're targeting and then automatically load those kernels. That's something you need to do by hand normally. So it's the speed up you can get from TF Lite. Um, but here this is done automatically, which is really nice and doesn't require you to set up anything. Um, and we also ship a couple of custom kernels. So for example, in Cortex-M0+, we ship a optimized convolutional kernel with a bunch of optimizations um, in how the convolutional layer is being run. And that's 23% faster on typical convolutional neural networks, which is a really big win. That's something you just get out of the box. Um, Ian is also really well tested. So for every release, we run uh, lots of smoke tests on real hardware. This is a screenshot of my desk um, from earlier today. We run, for every release, we run everything on real hardware with real models, with all the optimizations enabled, um, all the typical models that we see. And we deliver commercial support on this. So um, rather than having to rely on just an open source project, with the lack of support that comes from there, we can deliver commercial support on this. And we find a lot of bugs. <laughs> this is just a, a snapshot of the of the bugs that we found in CMSS and um, TFLM kernels. We've in ARM code, we've seen actually uh, writing, uh, writing outside of boundaries, uh, use after free bugs, uh, reshape layers that are not correct, et cetera. So we find these because we run actual smoke tests in real hardware. This naturally also comes back to the open source project. So all of these things have been fixed and contributed back to the open source projects, but we only deliver something that we know is going to be stable. Um, I'll go through this a bit faster. So we also play nicely with other sensors. So we have a really nice DSP library in Edge Impulse um, to deal with sensor data that we that we help in. Um, and yeah, last here, I think Eon is free, really important. So Eon is not a commercial compiler. It's available for everyone, uh, for every user of Edge Impulse. Just go to your project, click deploy, enable Eon, and that's it. You get the whole model as source code. There's not a single binary blob here. You can look at the source code, modify it, uh, debug it any way you want. It's Apache 2 licensed, all the data comes out just like any other part of our SDK and completely royalty free. Um, so I'll go through this a bit faster. Um, Ian is only part of the story. I think, as I said earlier, if you can avoid using neural networks, try and do that. Um, so we have really nice tools to kind of help you avoid neural networks and make them even smaller. Um, mostly around, mostly dealing with our signal processing pipelines. So for example, here is a accelerometer um, graph, really messy. A neural network can probably learn to distinguish um, based on this data. But we've learned that if we just apply a low pass filter, super standard signal processing code, we make it much cleaner, can deal with a much smaller network. Similar with audio data, go from audio, raw audio data to a time frequency domain, just with FFTs much smaller model, and we can run that much faster, much cleaner um, in that way. So think of this this way. I come from an embedded background. I can understand signal processing code a lot better than I can do machine learning models. So if you can pre-process something, and if you can avoid using neural networks at all, please do so. Your models will become much smaller, much more explainable. Um, and it also reduces significantly reduces the number of input features leading to much smaller networks. So by a combination of using signal processing and Eon, typically we can do you know, much, much, much smaller um, ML models that perform better than just throwing deep learning at everything. Um, and then, okay. So, okay, so what is the cool thing I think I uh, will show it in the demo is that um, we also have accurate performance numbers for all our code, both signal processing code, as well as our neural networks that we compile with Eon. Um, so if you change the parameter, like, and the length of an FFT um, when dealing with audio data or the number of layers in your neural network. We then compile the model, run it in Renode, which is an ARM emulator or kind of a microcontroller emulator. Um, and then we get accurate RAM, ROM, and latency numbers from that. So already while you're designing your ML model, we can tell you exactly whether it's going to fit within the constraints that you have, both latency, RAM, and flash constraints. Um, so that's, that's already there. I'll show it in you, to you in a little bit. Um, so all of this culminates, and I think this is for me the, the big thing that we're going to be building in 2021, um, comes together with the Eon Tuner. So we've done lots of grunt work in making it possible for people to build really good machine learning models. 
leveraging signal processing, neural networks, et cetera, um, utilizing it in the least amount of memory and least amount of flash possible and as fast as possible as well. Now the last part, which is what are the optimal parameters in my ML model? That's something we're going to tackle. And we've put all the little building blocks in place and Eon is a really key, the Eon compiler is a really key part of that. Um, but what we're going to be doing, and I hope to launch this somewhere in Q1, is the Eon tuner. So what we then say is, give me all your data, give me your constraints. So you need to run this on a Cortex M4F at 80 megahertz. I have a target latency of 20 milliseconds because you know I have a power budget that I need to care about. And I have a, a maximum RAM um, usage of say 40K. Find me the best model within those constraints, whether we're using signal processing or neural networks or classical ML algorithms, et cetera. So, um, I think it's really cool. We've done all the grunt work and kind of getting everything in place and hope, and I think this is going to be the culmination of everything, um, in trying to make it even easier for people to build these ML models. Um, so yeah, using Eon straightforward. Um, if you have an edge impulse project, I'll show you in a little bit how easy that is. Go to the deployment page, click the C++ library exports, um, enable Eon and that's it. You now have a royalty free open source, uh, library that compiles with any C++ compiler. If we detect that you're running an ARM or an ARC uh, course, we automatically load hardware optimizations. And we have examples for integration with Arduino, Embed OS, Zephyr, or FreeArch, as Mac OS, Linux, Metaware Toolkit, etc. cetera, um, all here on the docs page. And, and Katie will send out the uh, slides later on if you want to go through this a little bit quick, a uh, little bit by yourself. Um, so let's take a look actually at what, what EON now enables. All right, so I have my Edge Impulse. So Edge Impulse, um, to make a project, just go to edgeimpulse.com, click sign up, and you'll get to the studio. And the studio is the place where you build your machine learning models. It's where you collect your data, um, look at your data sets, organize them, um, set up your signal processing pipelines, and finally ML pipelines, um, and then compile them out. So um, here is a case where Eon actually made it possible to run an ML model on hardware that was previously impossible. And this is the Christmas tree recognizer. Um, so what I have here is a um, HiMax WEI plus development kit. Um, it's a very nifty board actually. Um, it has a, it does not have a microcontroller on it, but a DSP, um, but it's relatively fast. And it's about a mag, one megabyte of combined RAM and flash. Um, and that puts constraints on the size of my model. Um, so, you know, I started collecting some data. So here's a photo of my piano made this afternoon um, and a bunch of other stuff in my house. But what I wanted to detect was Christmas trees. So you'll see here, these are photos of my Christmas tree. Um, beautiful. So as you see, the HiMax board actually has a monochrome sensor, not a color one. Um, nice thing is that it's really cheap. And actually for lots of machine learning use cases, color is, I wouldn't say overrated, <laughs> but you can get very far with just building grayscale models. Um, so we put together an impulse. Um, so a pipeline of cropping my data to a certain um, standard form here, we normalized the 96 by 96 pixels, then a processing block. Um, here we just reduced the bit depth to, uh, to grayscale, but we can do all kinds of stuff. Um, I'll get back to that on the audio models. And then here a transfer learning block. So we can, let's just go to the image block first. Um, so here we just look at the image. The only thing we do is grayscale uh, dependency, but then we can get an idea of our data set. So we can separate our data after we generate features to see if the data separates nicely. So every item here in my data, every item in my data set is plotted here in a 3D graph. Um, and I see nice clusters already form. So I have lots of unknown data here in orange. I have lots of tree data here in the top. You can click on it. And that is indeed a tree. Um, and I don't see lots of overlap. So this is probably get, my machine learning model will probably be able to learn this pretty quickly. Um, I can look at some trees that were a bit out and that's places where there's actually a piece of my window um, included, um, which is fine. I mean, the ML model needs to learn from that anyway. Um, also here, we always show the only five performance. Um, so the signal processing pipeline for images is super efficient. Um, the kind of the only thing we need to do is get data from the frame buffer of the camera 
um, and get it into our ML model. So we have a couple of nice tools in our SDK to make this super efficient. So our frame buffer is 96 by 96 pixels, which is uh, 10K um, of RAM if you have a 8-bit color depth. We can kind of read all of that into our ML model without having to use an intermediate buffer. So this is kind of stuff you get for free. So that's why we can keep the peak RAM usage of 4K and just do the processing time in seven milliseconds, which is nice and quick. Um, and then we have our ML model um, here. To make it easy to build image models with very little data, um, we use transfer learning. So there we have pre-trained models um, that are discriminated on size. So we have a couple. So here we have a model that's 687K in size, 270K, 214K. So depending on the model where you want to run it, like we can even make models that are small enough to run in Cortex-M4 um, if you want. Um, we pre-train a model on lots of data. We strip off the top layers, retrain only those layers. And that's how we get a model that is um, performing very well, even on real, on real world data without having to collect thousands and thousands of data samples. Um, so, and here we can show the on-device performance as well, straight away. So if you change this for a different model version, then you'll see this drop um, dramatically straight away. So um, let's actually see if this model works. Um, and we can do this with live classification. So you can either do this with a fully connected device like the Hymax board, but I'm not going to touch it because you can't see what I'm seeing with that easily. So I'll use my phone for that. So cool little trick in Edge Impulse. Your phone is probably the most advanced sensor um, that you have in your house. So if you just want to build quickly a model or verify that a model works, you can just whip out your phone, go to devices, click add a new device, scan a QR code, and now your phone is your new sensor with both um, where you can get data from the accelerometer, microphone, and camera, and doing all of that from the browser. So you don't even need to install an app. So let's say they want to get some data from the camera. I'll give access, and I'll point it at my Christmas tree. And now it classifies. So cool, that was 100% a Christmas tree. Let's uh, try this again with uh, something else. This is my living room. Um, and that was not a Christmas tree, it's unknown in this case. So really cool. Cool, we have a model that works. Um, let's go to deployment and uh, put it into code. So. Here we click on the C++ library export because we want to integrate it in our own firmware. We can also build firmware for a HIMAX board straight from here, um, but it's a lot less interesting for this webinar. Um, and then whether to enable Eon, um, it's just a toggle here. So if I disable it, you'll see that the RAM usage and ROM usage goes to 774K. Yeah. Actually not do that. Um, and when I compile for the HIMAX boards, we'll immediately see that um, so we already load the right operator. So if you want to use tensor light um, for this, definitely go for it. We have everything set up already. We only load the right operator, so we make sure that everything's set up nicely. Uh, we do quantization, um, but we have a problem here. The total image size is bigger than the flash max size. So we have created a model that's not going to fit. But rather, if we run this with Eon um, and we compile, then um, because our RAM usage and our ROM usage is just smaller, um, this will go out of the box. And for you as a developer, there's no difference. You just write your code in any way. And then depending on the flags that we set in the library that we export, we'll either write this as, uh, we'll either write the EO model or the T-applied model. So what do you get from this library? Here's a, let's take a look. Hmm. So you just download the C++ library, that's what you get. I think I have it here. So the uh, EO model, is source code. Lots and lots and lots of source code. It's all the weights, uh, the connections of your network. And because we write this source code out, we can also determine, okay, well, we know which parts of these can go in flash and which part needs to go in ROM or in RAM because um, we have much better control of that, which allows us to do much more fine grade control. We also do static allocation here. So on the, yeah. So if you just want to allocate everything statically, do that. Otherwise, we then do it dynamically, which has some benefits because if you have if you have DSP code that takes lots of memory, you probably don't want to have everything allocated at the same time. 
Um, and here for Hymax, we can even put in a separate part of Flash, which is a lot slower than what we normally do. Um, let me write some code. Um, for sake of time, I'll just switch straight to the dev board. Um, I already flashed it on here. And let's see if this now runs on here. And we'll see how fast it is as well. So remember, this is a, running on a DSP, um, a low cost core, a low cost and low power core. Um, and we'll open up a UART to the dev boards. And we'll say, actually move my camera to the Christmas tree. There's really a Christmas tree in my house. Oh, it's pointing at the Christmas tree now. So pointing at me, not a Christmas tree. Pointing at the tree, bam, Christmas tree. Almost instantaneous. And that's because we can do eight inferences a second on this 400 megahertz DSP. Absolutely insane. Um, and this is with one of our larger models. We can even use a smaller model um, and, uh, and run this even on a Cortex-M4 if we really want. Um, in that case, the RAM and, and flash use is really important because that is kind of the key of the thing that you need to run there. So cool, my Christmas tree detector. Really nice, really fast. Um, and finally be able to run on this target just because we can do more with the same hardware. Um, naturally, it's not the only thing you can build. Um, so here's a, let's actually go to the right projects. Um, here's a thing that I pulled together for Microbit Live over the weekend. Um, so the Microbit is this little computer. I hope you guys can see it. Um, so it's a, it's a small dev board. A new version of the Microbit just came out. It has a bit more flash and a bit more RAM. I think it's 64 kilobytes of RAM now. Um, and it has a microcontroller or a, a microphone. So we actually pulled together a demo that can do audio classification here. In this case, keyword spotting recognition. So together with a whole bunch of people, I don't think you can hear this, but together during the session, we actually collected lots of data. Um, as part of our SDK, we ship with features like um, signal processing blocks to go from raw data to a kind of a spectrogram that highlights the interesting parts of the signal for you uh, in the way that humans process uh, speech. So this is a very small spectrogram. It's only 639 features or so, but it's good enough to actually train a model that can distinguish between microbit and any other words being sounded. So um, here you see the same feature explorer again, um, but now with much more data and we see nice clusters of microbit data here in blue, nicely separated from all the data here in green, which is people saying other words. Um, here we need to pair like a nice ML model. And this thing is super limited in the amount of RAM and flash that it can use. So being able to squeeze as much as possible out of here has been, has been really crucial in getting this kind of stuff to, to run even on this small $10 dev board. So, what I can say now is microbit. Don't work. Microbit. Yep, wait a minute. Let me plug that in and out. Microbit. Cool. So that works. So we can do amazing, cool stuff now. Um, so Ian is only part of the story, right? I think lots of the things that we do um, leverage everything that we do with. Um, the team at Google around TensorFlow Lite. It's the stuff that we do with the silicon vendors around new kernels. Um, but for us, kind of, you almost like the missing, it's one of the pieces here that makes it possible to run with an even more constrained hardware and run image models um, and audio models on, on smaller and smaller hardware. Um, so really cool. I hope people will play around with it. Um, so yeah, last two minutes and we'll go to the Q&A um, is recap. I think for me, the thing that I've realized over um, the, the past three and a half years that I've been building ML models, uh, first at ARM um, and later at Agimpulse, is that machine learning and sensors are a perfect fit. There's very little things. There's a couple of things that we can detect really easily in the real world, like what is the current temperature? Because people have made sensors that allow us to read temperature data. Um, but there's lots of data in the real world that is not unlocked at the moment. Um, what do I hear? What do I see? And that's something where machine learning with its inherent capabilities of 
finding hidden correlations in data is an absolute perfect fit. Um, and I also think that the machine learning hype is kind of, it's really real, it's really useful. We can really find hidden correlations or find better formulas compared to what we could do previously by just writing code. One of our uh, customers who has been using machine learning uh, within their products achieved a 15% point increase in accuracy for their own models compared to what they've built homegrown. Um, just by taking this approach of, okay, let's collect data. Let's try to see what the hidden correlations are in that data. Um, and let's build an ML model from that. Um, also, if you want to run these, run these models on device, design with these constraints in mind from day one. You have constraints when you're developing an ML model. It's you have latency requirements, you have memory requirements, you have flash requirements. Very often, if you have already have a product in the market and now for your ML model, you need to have a bigger MCU, well, that's a year and a half of a new design cycle. That's not something you want to go through. So already from the very moment that you start, and we try to make it really easy in a gym pulse by showing kind of the performance characteristics at any stage, um, is to design with these constraints in mind. And I, I think that Eon will help you push those constraints a little bit more um, and push bigger models uh, to smaller devices and hopefully be able to retrofit these models on these devices, but design with these constraints in mind. Um, and last, I think your experience, you as an embedded engineer, or you as someone who creates products um, or work in the industry, you have a much better idea of where machine learning could add value. Like, I know that we can do lots of amazing stuff around acceleration. I know lots of stuff about uh, audio and images and biosignal, um, but what if you have a radar sensor and currently you write uh, algorithms by hand, but you know there's probably something there that you can increase or improve. Try it out. I think that your experience, machine learning is an engineering tool. It's not a magic black box. It's an engineering tool um, and a unique opportunity for everyone. Um, so try that out, see how that fits. Um, and I'd love to support you and help you in any way we can um, at, at gimples.com. And with that, I'd like to take it over to Jenny for Q and A. So we got lots of great questions. Um, the first few are about um, what are the minimal hardware requirements in terms of CPU speed and RAM? That's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, the, it depends a little bit on the model that you want to run, naturally. Um, but typically what we see is that if you want to do anything with vibration, um, like predictive maintenance on machines, um, predictive, predicting when something fails, fitness trackers, um, so detecting what, so, what movement someone is doing, um, that's relatively low resolution data. And we can even do that on a Cortex-M0 Plus. So a Cortex-M0 Plus with a, at least a, I know, a beefy processor, um, but with 10K of RAM or so, is typically be able to do that. Um, for audio models or data where you, where you kind of have data in like tens of kilohertz, um, you want to go to an M4. Still, we can fit that mostly in 20, 30 kilobytes of RAM. Um, that's pretty okay, actually. Um, and then for image models, it's kind of as crazy as, as you want to go. Um, you have lots of parameters to play with. So if you want to do something with very small images, let's say you have enough 48 by 48 grayscale to detect um, people or something. So for a project we do in Africa with a partner, we actually use really tiny um, images from a thermal sensor. And that's enough actually to detect elephants and poachers already. Um, so if you do that, you can actually get away with, even with the Cortex-M4. Um, but yeah, if you want to go bigger, 96 by 96, or even larger, um, you'll have a bit of compute increase there. But a, an M7 or a, or a well-purpose DSP can do this very nicely. Cool. Um, and then we have a couple questions about the ESP32. I think these are related to, does Eon optimize for these targets specifically? Um, Yes and no. Um, so all the RAM and flash uh, improvements are there also for the ESP32. Um, we have, and the downside is what uh, Espresso has not done yet is have a library similar to CMS and N um, or what uh, Synopsis has done for us like Embark. So a way, a simple library that says, okay, this is how you do very fast uh, eight based matrix multiplication. Um, so we don't leverage the hardware as much as we do on ARM and our cores. 
Um, we do, however, swap out the convolutional kernels. So we see about 23% increase in performance on the ESP32 compared to TF Lite. But the RAM and, RAM and ROM inc uh, increases are there also for the ESP32. And I know people are deploying uh, Edge Impulse models on the ESP32 CAM. Okay. Um, is there a type of sensor data that works best with EON? Um, not really. I, it, it's the, the benefits. Um, it's kind of a weird curve. So the benefit percentage wise is the largest on small models because there the interpreter is relatively large. Um, but that's also often the place where it doesn't really matter too much, right? If my model takes 2K RAM or 5K of RAM, it's probably not going to make a really big difference unless I have really, really large constraints. Um, but when you go to image models, it's very often the case of will it fit or will it not fit on my hardware? Um, like what we've seen on the IMAX, like percentage wise, we win maybe 30% um, in RAM and flash, which is a lot less than we do in small gesture models where it can be up to 60%. But because 30% of 500K is a lot more than 50% than of 5K of, uh, of, of RAM, um, it's, it's all of a sudden the difference between do we need to go to a bigger part or can I stay at the current part or will the model fit at all um, with these constraints? So my feeling is uh, the larger the model, the, the bigger the benefit. Okay. Um, then we have a question from Marco. Uh, do we plan to contribute the Eon compiler code back to the TensorFlow repo? Yes, so we're working with the, um, so we, we've done this a little bit. So there's a working group in the uh, micro, in the TensorFlow or in the tiny ML6, what's it called again? Um, anyway, yeah, so there's a standards interest group um, that's being ran there. There's a working group that has been doing something very similar um, and we are not gonna, con yeah, we're contributing to that project. And so when the new TensorFlow compiler hits or the new uh, TensorFlow version hits, we can, we'll be contributing all of that back um, in there. So super interesting group and it's lots of really great people have been contributing to that. And I think it's really important for this to also be you know, published out in the open um, for people to contribute on because we don't exist in a vacuum. Um, as Katie hopefully sa as Katie said early on, I've been a very active uh, proponent of open source and I, I love to push everything that we put out as a Gimples also, um, at least on the device always as open source um, and there's nothing different there for Eon. So um, the moment that we upgrade to latest TF, we'll, uh, we'll contribute to fix back um, for everyone to see. Okay. Um, so then we have a couple questions about, uh, is this the maximum that we can achieve with Eon or is there even more that we can do to fine tune it? Um, I think, so there's a couple of things that I think are going to be interesting that we don't do at the moment, but that I would like to add to Eon. Um, so one of the one of the potential optimizations um, is pruning of networks. Um, so let's say that we have in our image model the one that detects the Christmas tree. We have I don't know maybe about let's say six hundred thousand parameters or so. Um, a lot a lot of parameters. Um, and when we invoke our ML model we kind of go through all of these little parameters to, kind of, to finally end up at our conclusion. But not all of these parameters are really important. It might very well be that there's a subset of the network that performs just as well um, as the big network, even better because there's some, uh, um, some parts of the network that have a negative effect on the accuracy. Um, the nice thing what we can do with Eon is I think because we control the whole flow, what we do in Edge Impulse kind of end to end, you collect your data so we know what your data is, you train your models, we know that, we have labeled data for everything. Is the thing that we can make very good decisions about um, what parts of your network can be pruned, yes or no, without having too much of an effect. Um, that's something we don't do at the moment, um, but I do think it's a super interesting research subject that we're going to hear a lot, not just by us, but also by all the other people in the, um, in the TensorFlow community. Because I think it has the potential to shrink models even by 2x more. Mm -hmm. So does it make sense to not use the Eon compiler when you're building your model? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, it might sound like a bit weird after this whole presentation, um, but there's one <laughs> really important use case, I think, um, 
when you when you deploy with Eon, your firmware, your ML model becomes part of your firmware, and that is not always desirable. Um, so what I fucking love about TensorFlow, um, and it kind of comes because TensorFlow Lite was originally envisioned as or came out of uh, a way of running ML models on uh, on uh, um, mobile phones, where these constraints are a bit uh, less, is they say, well, we go for it with an interpreter and a model file. So if you have a new model, you just push the new model file to the device, restart the interpreter, and bam, you have your new model. That is really nice and really flexible. So if you have a, if you want to be able to update your ML model in the field without having to do a full firmware update, which I think for lots of people is, is a desirable case, deploy with TFI. You have a bit bigger model, you have this overhead, um, but it allows you to do this without having to do a full firmware update. Um, and it can be pretty small. So for, uh, for a customer, we did this and we managed to get about 2K diff files on the, on the neural nets, which is cool because we needed to deliver this over an LPWAN connection. Um, so we had full model updates over LPWAN uh, flowing this way. And that you can't really do that with Eon because then you need to do a full firmware update, which, which naturally has a bunch of other implications. And then most questions go sort of hand in hand. Um, if you have like a custom model that's trained elsewhere, can you deploy it with Eon? And is that possible? Not at the moment. So we do a bunch of optimizations and we try to find this. Uh, we do a bunch of optimizations and like quantization steps, et cetera, that we can't really do on pre-trained models at the moment. Um, but there is the, uh, shit, I can't remember the name of the group, but there's the um, um, compiler group. I think if you search for a TensorFlow compiler group or something, you'll, uh, you'll find it. And I'll, I'll make sure I'll put a note of this in the email that you guys get after the webinar. So there is a group that we've been contributing some work to and been using some work from um, in the standard interest group that has been working on a standalone compiler. So then you just feed in your pre-trained TF Lite file and you get some source code out. So a similar idea is what we do with Eon, um, a bit less integrated. So that's something, that's a route that you can take, uh, that you can take there. And hopefully we'll merge those projects uh, early 20, 2021. And then next we have a few questions about how can we run multiple models at the same time? Um, so there's inherently nothing stopping you. Um, yeah, so, good. so our SDK is not set up for it, but the Eon model, um, the Eon model is self-contained. So uh, you allocate some memory and then you just run the setup function and you run the inference function. Um, so with a bit of legwork, you can prefix all of those functions with a unique identifier, model one inference run, model two inference run, um, and get that to run that way. Um, it's not something we currently facilitate from Edge Impulse, but it's relatively straightforward to do if you uh, if you integrate it yourself. And uh, if you want to end up doing this, we can help you out with that on the forums. Yeah, so uh, we have amazing forums, lots of activity, and Jenny and Aurelien are our user success engineers, um, and they're always happy to help and lend a friendly hand. So, uh, Should we do a couple more questions or? I think we're uh, almost there. More. Okay. Um, let me see. Oh, um, there's one about custom models. Um, what frameworks we support PyTorch TensorFlow? Um, in Impulse, we do everything with um, Keras underneath, which then back, or no, not that we don't do everything, but our neural network parts um, are all Keras with TensorFlow underneath. Um, and you have full freedom actually in designing those image impulse. So we have a nice user interface for uh, putting your model together and we have nice pre-trained pre models to do transfer learning from. But there's three little dots in the top right corner of, the, of any neural network page. You just click edit this, uh, edit in expert mode and you should get Keras, Keras code editor. Um, you have full freedom in, uh, in your optimization uh, or your optimizer, the number of layers, et cetera, um, all in there. So if you already have a model that is training Keras or TensorFlow, just head there, paste your own model in, and that will work end-to-end um, -end in Agentals. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jan and Jenny. We really appreciate your time and uh, coming to share all this information. It was really great. 
I know we didn't get to everyone's questions and I apologize for that. Um, I did put the link to the forum in the chat there so you can grab that and ask any questions that you might have there. Uh, we will have be sending out an email later with the slides um, with the questions that were answered. And um, if you have any other questions, you can always contact us at help at hackster.io and we can help you out there. Um, so thanks again for joining us and we appreciate your, all your time and uh, have a great rest of your day. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.